Okay, so let's welcome Andrei Koman, and he'll talk to us about testing the web application with Selenium. Okay. Uh, this working? Yep. Cool. So uh, effectively testing, effectively test your web app with Python and Selenium. That's a mouthful, right? Uh, so what's this talk actually about? Uh, I've been working on a project for a pretty long time now, and I got to see like from its beginnings how uh, the project itself evolved, like the code base, and how the test around it evolved, because we uh, uh, reached some conclusions at some points in time, and it, we tried to improve what we had. Uh, and that's what I want to share with you guys, like uh, what we learned from that, and uh, hoping that you don't make the same mistakes that we did. Uh, cool. Okay. Uh, so my name is Andrei Koman. I'm from Timisoara. That's a city in Romania, in the west of Romania. Uh, I work at Three Pillar for um, PBS. That's the public broadcast system in uh, the U.S. Uh, you can find me at uh, find some of my code on GitHub or follow me on Twitter. That's cool. Uh, how about you guys? How many of you have been working with Selenium? Well, quite a lot. Uh, how many of you are like QA, software engineering tests, something? Okay, a lot less. That's not. It's not a bad thing. Uh, so, well, let's get cracking then, right? Uh, we kind of have like I like to think of it. Uh, like the way the tests evolved in three phases. And we're going to take a look at each phase and see uh, what we did right in each phase, what we did uh, not so good, and how we try to iterate over that in the next phase. OK? Cool. So this is how a test looked like in like the first phase. Bear in mind that this has been like in the beginnings of the project where the QA team didn't have that much support for development because we were like in crunch mode to get features out. Uh, so uh, this is well, like, uh, what the tests look like. Uh, let's create a resource, think of a resource like a blog post or something. Uh, gave it a title, right, pretty instant. Uh, and then we had a test that kind of views that particular resource. Nothing out of the ordinary till now. So let's take a look at how uh, the page object model for Selenium looked like. So uh, we were good kids, and we separated the Selenium interaction from the test itself. So we have like this page object model classes that model the page. Uh, and at the time, we were using expat. So to get the title, we were doing like getting the div and going. Uh, by a specific ID, then you know, go a level up, and it starts to get a little bit confusing, right? Cool. So uh, what this test was hiding, actually, that uh, at the time we were using nose tests as our, as our test runner. And nose tests, when it starts collecting your tests by default, uh, it runs them in alphabetical order. So if C goes before V, you can uh, use your test kind of like a means to create the fixture and the state for the test on the server, and then uh, test that uh, in a different test. You can see how that kind of doesn't scale and contradicts some uh, good practices of keeping tests separated and uh, independent. Uh, and yep, this is the. Uh, kind of the problem with the way we use Selenium. So we used the page object model. That was cool. But we had this really long expat that makes my head hurt uh, when I try to read it. And uh, whenever a developer came in unknowingly and changed the way the HTML was structured for the specific page, well, that expat, that test got broken inadvertently. So uh, all these tests were running like on a 
environment. We were giving it, hey, run this on production, run this on QA, run this on staging. But yeah, you can imagine that if uh, the tests were failing like midway, it's not that cool that you left uh, leftovers on production. Okay. So yeah, as I said, we wanted something better. We wanted uh, wanted to stop using tests as fixture generators. Uh, we want to move to something more robust in terms of identifying a selenium element and interacting with it, being getting it, being it, getting its value, or uh, interacting with that element, like if it's a button, click on it or something. So uh, I think at the time we upgraded to Django to one four, and then we had live server test case. So we said, yeah, let's give that a shot. Why not? And then uh, all the problems with setting up fixtures kind of magically went away because we were using the Django RM to create like the state we were going to test. And uh, using tests to just uh, do a targeted uh, test to see, yeah, this is the title of the page where I can click on a specific element and the video plays or stuff like that. And we weren't stuck into in that uh, like kind of end-to-end -end test where you need to create something maybe using the admin and then test it using the, the published state. So this was like a better world for us, right? We can run tests independently, we can parallelize, which we couldn't do uh, without many headaches before. So this is good, right? Uh, so we also took note of how we were handling Selenium integration. And we started moving to something more specific. So we started hooking into IDs or CSS selectors. And that gave us uh, also more readability into the code. Like, you know, it's going to be an ID called title. And uh, it was also less brittle, because once you moved like sections of HTML in your templates, it's, it's not as likely to break the tests with that. Cool. So what's the problem with this kind of approach? Uh, it's not testing the real environment. Now, when you get that email in the middle of the day saying that, hey, we are a team that uh, you're a client of, so like we have uh, a team that manages RR image ingestion and resizing, right? And if they make a deploy, they kind of send us an email, hey, run some tests to make sure your production environment still works. Well, you can't really use these tests for that kind of thing because these tests spin up like a really bare bones environment. You just create just enough data to do your test in them, and afterwards you throw them away. And they're not really designed to um, test a real environment. Whereas in the previous approach, we, we were actually testing like QA production and so on. Cool. Uh, this is a good thing that in uh, the page object model we started using IDs. But uh, then again, we could do a bit better here too. Okay? So, what we had, what we wanted to do better after all these two phases were like separating long running tests from short tests. You still like to have like end-to-end -end tests that go maybe through multiple parts of your application and test the workflow. But maybe something like if you have a blog and you just check that the specific page works, that's good enough for like a smoke test. Uh, Google does this. So on how Google tests software, they have like a section where they uh, kind of chunk tests in medium, uh, or small, large, extra large. And the uh, small tests are the unit tests the developer runs on his machine. The large tests are more like these integration tests. And uh, 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 an extra large would be like an end-to-end -end test. So it's important to put uh, a distinction between these and put time boxes in which uh, a test suite, like all my large tests, must run under five minutes. Uh, Running them in independently, that's kind of a 
conflict between the first phase and second phase. So in the first phase, we can run them independently, but we could use an environment. In the second phase, we ran them independently, but we weren't hitting any real environment. Uh, so uh, we started looking around. Uh, I mentioned we were using nose tests, but PyTest was like the new kid on the block, and it made sense to try to look at what that has to offer. Uh, we put a limit on our Selenium uh, suite, like you know, it has to ha uh, it has to run in under five minutes, five or ten minutes. Previously, our whole Selenium uh, was running in I think 45 minutes, and in the first uh, iteration, so in the first phase, it was really hard to debug a test. So if you wanted to, if it failed, like in the view part, you had to go through all the creation, and it was a very cumbersome and uh, hard effort to debug. Uh, so also what we wanted to make an emphasis on is decoupling the test from the HTML structure of the page. And for this, we, wanna, uh, we went a step further from uh, hooking, so identifying elements from existing uh, CSS selectors or uh, you know, IDs in the page to setting up a convention between the development team and the QA team saying, hey, this is a, uh, a prefix which all the identifiers, so if you have a class like Selenium dash something, that's reserved for testing, so for allowing testers to hook up to that, identify that element, and do stuff with it. It's important not to tie any CSS or JavaScript functionality to that, because you're just gonna go in the loophole. And, uh, it's, it's important to keep uh, that those test hooks uh, focused only on that. So uh, how does the test look like in, uh, nowadays, right? Uh, the page is pretty much the same, except that we added stuff like a Selenium prefix to everything. So uh, you don't go in and rely on uh, IDs or CSS classes that were put in on developers and maybe make that specific element red or pop out or something. Okay. And also we kept the same page object model uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. And test-wise, because we switched to PyTest, uh, we started using uh, uh, a couple of interesting plugins from the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, they open sourced uh, a few plugins that I'm gonna showcase uh, a bit later in the presentation. Uh, but they really helped us to ramp up uh, on a new test suite. Cool. So one of the first plugins that I, uh, I tried out was PyTest Variables. This is something that you can put in to your project and uh, keep like your fixtures or your uh, credentials or something like that in a JSON file and then pass that in into the test. This kind of separates your fixture data, your uh, credentials from the code itself. And it uh, has a pretty simple interface. Pretty cool for our, uh, the Mozilla guys to open source this. Uh, otherwise, there's PyStats HTML. It's a really cool plugin that uh, it's not necessarily tied to the Selenium integration, but it provides you like with a test report saying, uh, hey, this test failed here, and these were the values that it failed at. Uh, and if you're using it in conjunction with the PyTest HTML, uh, the PyTest Selenium plugin from the Mozilla guys, it also hooks in and puts you a screenshot from when uh, the test failed. That's pretty cool. Uh, PyTest Selenium, this is the uh, PyTest plugin that the Mozilla Foundation open sourced. It's pretty cool, it has a lot of Chrome drivers, uh, a lot of web drivers, sorry, Chrome, Firefox. Uh, fun fact, we initially ran all our tests on Firefox, and then after switching to Chrome, we saw a significant performance improvement. That's, uh, and it was pretty cool that this plugin allowed us just to change a parameter somewhere, and then all our tests were like running on 
Chrome instead of that. And also they uh, have support for connecting with cloud-based testing services like Sauce Labs or Browser Stack. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I think for Chrome, you need to install the Chrome driver. Other than that, uh, you need to install the Selenium package in your environment. And then it Okay, so what I was thinking for you guys to take away from this talk is, uh, and what we're planning to do on the project going forward is leveraging APIs to create data fixtures. So if you have like a REST API to create stuff and uh, remove stuff from your, uh, from your app, try to leverage that, you know, like creating a blog post and then deleted it for test purposes. Uh, adding additional metadata into your um, into your page. So these are the that convention between the development of the QA team that everything prefixed with something Selenium. It would be whatever banana or whatever you want. Uh, and last but not least, defining like these test classes. So uh, I have large tests. I have small tests, and time, put time boxes around them. And when that, uh, when that specific class exceeds that time box, then you really should uh, look at failing that whole class and looking at why all of a sudden my whole large test cases, like maybe that's a smoke test, so it, it's running slower than before. Cool. Uh, that was about it. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Uh, do you know of an easy way to get video recording of these test runs? Uh, not really. I haven't toyed around with that yet. But that's an interesting point. Uh, I'll try to check up with the Mozilla program. Maybe they, they offer that. If not, maybe it's something worth contributing to open source. I know in the past we were uh, at a previous company we were using VNC to FLV to record test runs and see why it failed. But okay. Uh, to answer the previous question, I know Mozilla has something because they uh, use videos in PyTest HTML. So maybe to just check the documentation for that. And to ho I hope it's documented. If not, open an issue. And then maybe it will be. Any other questions? Um, have you looked into Splinter at all and uh, PyTest Splinter plugin? Are you? Mm, I haven't. It's I'm a curious. convenience wrapper library in Python for Selenium, which helps you write better uh, asserts without going into the markup. So it's like instead of putting .sel uh, markup everywhere, it helps you to write better tests that are less brittle. So maybe just a hint, uh, it's, it makes it easier to write nicer tests. Cool. I'm curious to talk to you about that afterwards. Thanks. Uh, how did you version your page objects if you were making changes in in the application? Did, how how did you deal with having different versions of uh, and like good regression one. testing with Selenium? Good one. So uh, what we're trying now is trying to get an element, and if you can't uh, get to that hook element, you skip the test and uh, mark it as skipped and see uh, say that hey this test was skipped until that code reaches that the environment you're trying to test. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if is that, that that's all, let's say thank you to Andre. Thank you.